Mergers and acquisitions represent a great way or a great opportunity to grow. This week, we're going to find out how it's done by the pros. Will Slappy is joining us all the way from Alabama on Insights as a Service this week to talk about his experience with more than eight acquisitions to date. Let's get into it. Uh, Will Slappy, CEO of IT Voice, uh, Iron Man, I'm told, uh, <laughs> by you, uh, and uh, Serial Acquirer of Businesses. Thanks for joining us. Yes, there we go. Well placed. Hey, look, so we've got you on because we want to essentially um, just learn everything you've learned in your um, journey through acquiring what I believe to be eight businesses over the last three years alone. Yes. That, yep. That's right. Look at me go. All right. So yeah, may, maybe start off, um, just paint us a little bit of a picture at what point in your um, MSP journey or, or telco journey, in fact, um, did you start to look uh, to to pursue a acquisition-based uh, growth strategy? Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you the uh, the short version uh, okay. of the long story. Uh, my father founded the company back in the 80s. Uh, I took over running it around 2015. And then in 2019, um, we wanted to kind of take the company to the next level. So my, my father was officially kind of transferring out at that point in time. Uh, so we actually brought in some outside investment, let him take some chips off the table, if you will. And uh, that's when we started the the fast growth uh, pursuit and uh, started acquiring companies. Did the first one in September of 2019 and uh, have done a total of uh, eight. Um, we will probably acquire somewhere between five and 10 this year uh, wow. in, in terms of what, we, what we've got uh, kind of scheduled for uh, closing out the year. So, so how do you find those opportunities? Is it just a dedicated, fo dedicated focus of yours now in your role that that takes up the majority of your time? Uh, so part of bringing in the outside investment was uh, the guys that we brought in were specific PE acquisition bent guys who brought that expertise to the table. So it's been great for me because, you know, I knew everything, maybe not everything, but I definitely knew how to operate, right? I grew up in my father's business. I'd been to all the conferences, done almost every role in the company. So from an operations perspective, I understand the business intimately. Uh, behavioral economics was my degree. So Knew enough in the finance world to be dangerous, but certainly didn't have a real world practical experience in that. And so it's been great to have uh, the PE guys as a part of the team uh, because they bring that experience you know, to the table. Um, and so we do that together. Uh, they do a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of finding them. We've got all sorts of inbound leads. We've got buyers, brokers, et cetera, that are looking you know, for companies to acquire. Um, and then uh, as it gets farther in the process, and especially as we get to more the operating side, whether it be, is it the right fit for our business uh, culturally or technology, te technologically? Uh, that's where I start to get involved. And then um, when we get in that last month uh, is when I start to get really involved because that's when we start to begin the integration plans, you know, the actual acquiring of the business um, and then how we're going to bridge them into our operations. And so that's when, when, you know, I get all the way up to here, you know, in each of the acquisitions that we do. And so I would like, you'll be able to school me more than well, you'll be able to school me full stop. But as I understand it, really, when it, when it comes to acquisitions, there's kind of a, a value-based uh, driver and maybe a strategic-based driver. So value can simply be, what do they earn? How much of that can we throw into our business by you know taking what synergies are available and, and just wrap it in and off we go? Whereas maybe strategic is looking more at um, key competencies or capabilities that you can add to your existing stack while retaining that knowledge, those people, et cetera. Um, is there, uh, have you gone for a mix of those? Is there one that, that, that PE particularly likes more than the other? What's your experience been? Um, yeah, so I've, I've been asked this kind of question a lot and it's, you know, like how to, how, how, I'll go through our factors, which may be, may be uh, yeah. important uh, or helpful uh, to you and your audience. Um, and they maybe kind of talk about how they play together. So, uh, there's, um, so the first, first factor is the cultural fit, right? Um, for us, you know, the customer's extremely important. We're a customer-centric, customer service organization. And so you've got to have a company who believes in that. Um, somebody who's doing, let's just say, a volume play, which is a perfectly fine business, right? Um, it, it would not necessarily be, be a fit. Um, you know, somebody who's kind of a slash and burn model, you know, different things like that wouldn't be a fit. So, you know, we, we've got our four core values, focus on others, work smart, do the right thing, and own it. Uh, and so those are our four cap core values. So we've got to make sure that, hey, that's not going to be a shock to the other company's culture. Uh, otherwise, you're asking your, for some big problems. 
um, if you dive in, you know, with a company that's, you know, uh, has a different culture. It doesn't mean it has to be exactly the same, but it has to be compatible. Uh, yeah. So we start there. Um, recurring revenue uh, would be the next item. So minimum is like 50 to 60% recurring revenue. Ideally, it's 80% plus in terms of what we want to see uh, in recurring revenue. Um, on the IT side of the business, you have some, some businesses that have lagged. And, you know, I call them quasi-recurring revenue businesses where they have clients who call them every month and they're billing them on a time and material basis. So it's it's recurring and they have the recurring relationship, but they're not in a recurring fixed price contract like the MSP community has you know matured to. So that's where there can be some leeway. Now, from a multiple perspective, those companies aren't going to get as big of a multiple, but you know we will consider them uh, if it's the right fit. Um, co- contract uh, is is uh, is one of the factors that's important to us. So somebody who has month to month contracts compared to somebody who's got you know, two, three, five year agreements, uh, that becomes, you know, an important piece. Um, and as a part of that, you've probably seen like the contract waterfalls, right? And so like how much of their revenue is under contract for how long, uh, because those are the risk factors that we come into play. So, I mean, we're talking about an acquisition right now, um, which is one of, one of the next factors in terms of what is the largest customer's percent of your revenue. And those two play hand in hand, because even if you have a large customer, but if they're under a really strong contract and there's, you know, three years left in that contract, that makes an acquirer like ourselves feel a lot more comfortable with it because that large customer can't, you know, bail with 20 percent of your revenue the day after we acquire the business. If there's a month to month contract in place, you know, and they make up a large percent, then that becomes an issue. Now, you know, some companies we've looked at, maybe they don't they have all month to month, but their largest customer only makes up one percent. Well, then you're not as concerned with it as if you have a large customer. So that's how some of the different factors kind of work together. Um, it, tying into that, churn rate is another important factor that we're looking at. So, hey, you know, how often are their customers turning over? That also tells us a lot about the business. I mean, it's a well-run business that's customer-centric. You should have a very low churn rate compared to if it's a business that, you know, is a volume-based business, you would have, you know, a, a higher churn rate usually. Uh, revenue, uh, growth rate is another factor we're going to look at. So is the business growing? Is it declining? You know, um, if it's growing, what's causing it to grow? Will the factors be, you know, behind that? If it's declining, doesn't mean we can't acquire the company, probably going to have a lower multiple and we're going to want to understand why is it declining? Is there something wrong with the business? You know, or maybe they had one large client that they lost and overall the business has grown other than losing. So we don't understand the context uh, of that. Uh, even a margin, important factor. So the higher the EBITDA margin, a lot of times that tells us the maturity level, the operational maturity, if you will, of a company um, is many times tied to uh, the EBITDA margin. Um, and uh, and that's also part of the, you know, all of these factors, because we're also looking at the value of our company. And so all of these factors as we're bringing these companies in also affect the you know, value of our company as well. So we're looking at that. Hmm. We talked about the you know largest customer percent and how that works together. Um, so so those are you know the, 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 the pieces that we are looking at in terms of evaluating um, a company and whether or not it's the right fit for us. Um, I get asked the question all the time of like, and I think you were kind of asking this, like, you know, maybe the order of what's more most important. Um, on, a, on a lot of these, um, there's kind of like some minimum thresholds, if you will. So, you know, you could be a perfect fit on all of them, for example, but if you only have one customer I and mean, you could be a hundred percent recurring revenue, you know, um, and the, and, and have zero churn because you only have the one customer, you know, and that customer could be growing. And so you have great growth, you know, and obviously I'm being facetious. I mean, there's probably not a lot of companies sure. that literally have only one customer, you know, but if you only have one customer that makes a hundred percent, you know, now if it's under a really good contract, possibly you could overcome that. So again, that's how it all factors in, but that would make us massively concerned with a deal like that because are we really buying a company or are we just buying, buying a, customer. a customer? Right. Yeah. So, um, so, so sometimes it kind of, you know, it, it, it's hard to say like which one is the most important because any one of them at a certain point could make it to where we wouldn't want to do the deal. Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't want somebody to think, okay, I just got to focus on this one thing most important. I, I would really encourage people to focus on all of them. Um, you know, if I had to pick one as the most important, it would probably be the percent recurring revenue. Uh, it, you talk to anybody, you know, in terms of multiples, if you, to the extreme. You have a company that's 100% recurring revenue, and you have a company that's 100% non-recurring revenue. The difference in multiples is going to be somewhere between three and five x difference between those. 
So the, you've got the the value of the customer base based on a lot of those metrics, you know, the recurring revenue, the contract period, the the risk factor of being top heavy or whatever. But then I guess there's also value in the business. If it's got really well defined processes, automated processes, it's picking the right metrics so it can give you the numbers you want immediately on, you know, um, stack adoption by each client, for example, and, you know, how often they've been met and what their call cycle is and all those kind of good things. Um, you know, how much value does the, is an MSP able to add to its, its sell price if they're looking for an exit in those sort of value add pieces past just the, the, the value of their customer base? how they actually run as an operation? How much value can that add? Um, so it, I would say the value is more indirect than direct. So when we're looking at a company and we're looking at, you know, all the factors that, you know, let's pick one, like, you know, how much of the stack adoption that they have. So in our um, model, we don't really put a lot of value on stack adoption. Okay. However, the more stack adoption that they have, the higher the EBITDA margin is, and the more EBITDA that they usually have as a company. So, and they are going to get a higher credit for that. Their percent of recurring revenue is probably going to be higher because they have a higher stack adoption. So it does matter, but the way that we measure it in our model, it's going to matter more indirectly. Yeah, but, it feeds into you know, those other if, metrics. Right, exactly. Yeah, it's I mean, it's like the same, you know, if you're in sales, you'd be like, well, how, how much does it matter how much you prospect? Well, it doesn't really. It matters how much you sell. But if you don't do any prospecting or any marketing, you're probably not going to sell nearly as much as if you did. So yeah. they're important. But when it comes to when it gets to our stage, you know, if I'm looking at two businesses and like side by side, and I have one business that has a higher even a margin, a higher recurring revenue percent more EBITDA, and this other company has less of all those things, but they have a really high adoption on their stack. Like, which company am I going to choose, right? I'm going to choose the one that has the higher uh, on our model. Yeah. Um, you know, now, in that case, this company has probably got a lot less customers, right? And, and their efficiency on a per-customer basis is probably a lot higher. And as they continue to grow, they would eventually, you know, all else being equal, they would beat out the other company. Um, but, um, that's also, I mean, for us, we look at that as an upside cause we, um, you know, we're going to bridge it all. We're going to bridge it all together and we're going to focus on cross selling and, and put those customers into our model eventually. And when we get to the integration stage. And so, um, it, 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 it doesn't really like directly, you know, fit, uh, fit for us. Now the, the one piece, and this probably goes kind of across the board, uh, there is a certain piece, and that we don't have like an exact piece for a model, but certainly a part of our conversation is the expertise that a company brings to the table is kind of that uh, extra factor, if you will. Um, so there are, you know, it, the hard part about that is a lot of times it depends on the acquirer. So when there's a company that we look at and I'm like, ooh, that fits a hole in our business, we don't have as much of that expertise as we need. Uh, we don't have a really good product in that. Now that's something that I want to provide to our customer base and they bring that to the table. Yep. But that's but you may go to another acquirer that's like, oh yeah, we got that in spades. And it that doesn't drive the extra value. So that gets a little bit tricky because that you 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 happen to find the one missing card that they need, and then now it's worth it more to them. Um, but that's going to be different for different acquirers. Totally. But that, that really, that there exactly highlights that concept of strategic buying, right? Like you're going, we are looking to not just buy the scale, but buy the, the, the skill set, the expertise, et cetera. And then I guess that's where in that hypothetical scenario, your valuation in the multiple you're prepared to pay would likely be higher than company B that's already got that in spades. So, um, that kind of highlights that, that, that well, um, might be a really hard question and i and i think it's good if we limit this question to your market because it may be different than australia and new zealand but um what's the range of multiples you've seen in play and 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 the the number that multiples based off so the number one driver for the multiple is going to be the size of the company um and the, the, the ultimately the size of the ebitda so if you've got a company that's let's just say five hundred thousand dollars of ebitda is going to be a smaller uh, multiple than if you have a company who is five, you know, million in EBITDA. Um, so the um, 
kind of the multiple range numbers, you know, if you're, if you're sub 1 million in, um, in EBITDA, then, you know, you're probably going to be in like the three to five X range okay. in terms of what it's going to be. So that kind of gives, so, so that the size of the EBITDA gives you the range. And then the, the seven factors that I talked about now yeah. begin to, that begins to say, okay, are you three? Are you four? Are you five? Based upon how you rank in terms of, you know, uh, the multiple, uh, you start to get up to like 2 million, you know, the range now starts to get, you know, four to may, I don't probably seven, you know, okay. maybe eight for like a perfect company. The um, I don't know if I've seen very many of those at that size though. Um, so probably more like four to seven, you know, okay. when you start getting to five, you know, million, you know, the multiple starts to go, um, you know, up to, you know, seven to 12 type range. Um, are you, are you finding speed. too, like, as you get bigger, um, through these acquisitions in your organic growth as well, that you just become disinterested, uh, uh, in any opportunity below a certain size because the cost of integration versus the reward of bringing on board that revenue is just not justified? Um, it's kind of always been the same for us. So like the absolute bare minimum for us would be like 200,000 in EBITDA. Um, right. our, I mean, as, you know, at a certain size, it, we're not there yet. We're probably a decent way away before we would not be interested. Um, um, but it's certainly for some companies, I mean, you know, part of the reason why the multiple goes up is the big fish out there, say the big PE groups, they don't want to go do a hundred deals and all the work that it takes to pull a hundred companies together or whatever. You know, if you got 200,000, mm -hmm. you know, even a companies and you pull a hundred of them together, you know, now you're at 20 million or something like that total. So that's a, that's a, a lot, of, a lot, a lot of work, you know, in order to get there, they would rather just buy one or two companies and push them together. Right. Um, yeah. So that's part of what, you know, um, uh, drives the higher multiple, you know, for those bigger companies. Um, when you, the part of the reason for us, like, I mean, really 500,000 is really where we like to start. We, you know, a couple of times I've gone below that, uh, but the multiple starts going down as we go below that. Um, and a lot of it, there's a fixed cost. So our attorney's fees, for example, are about the same if it's a five hundred thousand dollar, or if it's a, you know, two million EBITDA uh, company. The attorneys' fees are almost identical, um, okay. and so you get you start to get from a deal perspective, the difference between the two size companies is two three percent difference. I mean, you know, you've got a handful more customers to look at. Um, a lot of times, the 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 different like the seven factors, a lot of times look better as the company gets bigger. You're you're less likely to have a large customer, for example, to be a large percentage of your revenue when you're, as you get larger, it can happen of yeah. course, but, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's less likely. A lot of times churn goes down, you know, you get more mature as a, as a, as a company, uh, you've got better processes. A lot of times as you get larger, you have better documentation. So when we give you our due diligence list, you get us the information we need sooner. Um, and so, um, really for us, it's like, you know, but for us, our incentive to buy smaller is because it's a lower multiple. So, mm. hey, if we buy three smaller companies at a lower multiple, then now we've produced more value for ourselves and done, done more work. So, uh, mm. but some companies, you know, every, every company has their threshold. They're like, it's just not worth it, worth it to us to go below this. In the same way, like your listeners, I'm sure every listener, their company has some sort of minimum that they're like, whether it's $3,000 a month or $500 a month or $10,000 a month. I'm sure all of your listeners have some sort of threshold they're like, it's not worth it for us to get a client below that. And it's kind of the same in the acquisition world. Okay. So with the um, recession word being thrown around a bit at the moment, um, both uh, in both of our countries, um, do you see that presenting any unique opportunities from the, the M&A perspective? So I actually had a conversation with one of the uh, industry experts here in the, in, in the U.S. this morning, and he confirmed what I was already sensing in, in our talks with companies. You know, the, the multiples have loosened, uh, reduced by about a, a half to uh, one full multiple since, say, December of last year. So wow. the multiples. Okay. So, so what happens is that it's, it's kind of tied to the stock market. Um, because when investors are like, okay, I could go to the stock market and get this, you know, return, this is what I would do. And then all of a sudden if that goes down, you know, that usually follows into the private sector as well. Um, so there's kind of a little bit of a lag, but ultimately that ends up, ends up, fo you know, um, following, um, there's a lot of, I mean, a lot in, in the acquisition world, 
I don't want to say all of it, but a huge chunk of it is driven by private equity. And so whenever the market kind of goes into recession, a lot of times private equity, I mean, we saw this happen with COVID. Um, and we had, we had, you know, I mean, there was all sorts of deals that you heard of that, you know, got either completely killed or massively delayed because of COVID, because when we entered in that uncertain time, everybody pumped the brakes, you know, and, uh, and stopped. So um, you will see that happen right now where um, you'll, you'll have, you know, groups that will pump the brakes because the recession, which, you know, uh, my take on it is we're already in a recession, but you, you you know, you can't always tell you're in a recession until you look back hindsight and be like, oh yeah, that's when the recession started. Yeah. But, you know, all, all the industry and, you know, just macro experts that I listen to, it sounds like, you know, all of the indicators are there that we're already into, um, into a recession as we speak. Yeah, it's the lagging indicators that that confirm it. But you're right, there's there's some leading indications there as well that we kind of just feel. Um, uh, I, I guess this is a slight aside from the M and A piece exactly. But um, for MSPs in a recessionary period, um, I had this raised with me the other day by one of our partners that um, this this particular gentleman saw it as an opportunity that that MSPs typically did well during a period of recession because uh, companies are looking to outsource the IT function quite often, and uh, you know that's not good news to people working in IT inside private companies. But um, means that um, a there's a greater pool of of uh, talent out there to attract to your MSP, and also a lot more companies actively looking for solutions uh, via outsourcing. Do you do you align with that way of thinking? Yeah. In my experience, yeah, that's true. Um, I don't know that I I don't know if it's because of the outsourcing that causes it necessarily. I don't know that I've it, you know um, studied it well enough to know what the cause is, but I certainly uh, agree with the conclusion that um, when things tighten up, now on the project side of things, they usually go down though. So it kind of depends on where the MSP. If it's a heavy recurring revenue MSP, which if it's a true MSP, it should be. Um, then they should be able to do well. Um, and there's also an opportunity for MSPs to true up uh, some of maybe the lagging pieces. So like being under contract, for example, um, I'm, all of the best MSPs that I know when COVID hit, what did they do? Hey, Mr. Customer, you know, renew with a three, three year, five year deal. We'll give you a month or two free, you know, and, uh, and now they true up their entire book and getting all their customers back into renewed contracts because now they're helping their customers and all they're doing is financing that, you know, month or two that they're giving them to free, you know, into the deal. But now they get everybody under contract. So, you know, an MSP that you could see this as a big opportunity. Hey, one, let's go steal some business. Let's offer some free months to get some people under contract. Let's, whether they're outsourcing it or you're just undercutting some other MSP that's out there um, or depending on like in our, in our markets, uh, sometimes you have companies who don't even have an MSP and they don't have necessarily somebody on staff either. They're kind of a little DIYing it, maybe piecing it together. Maybe they got a one person, you know, trunker or something like that. That's what we call it, like one man in a in a trunk, you know, that are that are doing their IT and they're yep. they they realize hey now they need to get more serious about it. Um so there's a lot of opportunity that's that's there in the market, not only to gain from the revenue side, but I think probably one of the biggest opportunities is gain from the contractual side because you've got customers that you can now you have to leverage something like a free month to get them under longer term contracts. Yeah, I would, I would imagine during a, a recessionary period that your average business is looking for ways to automate um, your repeated tasks. Uh, they're looking for ways to essentially, you know, keep the bottom line as healthy as it can be. And and so in in your industry, you're really going and going, what problem we're we looking to solve? We're looking to to solve these financial pressures, or at least ease them as much as we can. We can do that through using technology. And you know, here's the here's the pitch, um, and then hopefully that that you know, price point isn't prohibitive, but um, yeah. So uh, and, you know, the one thing that I'm really curious about, and I have some thoughts, but just as kind of a, a point to make, that's mm-hmm. unique, I think. The, the thing that's unique about specifically the recession that we're in now, assuming that we're in one, compared to, let's just say, you know, 08, 09, is that you had zero inflation in 08, 09. Whereas we've got, depending on who you talk to, we've got double digit inflation that's happening right now and a recession simultaneously, the inf- depending on who you listen to, the inflation is probably part of the cause of the recession as well. Um, you know, because you know, food prices, gas prices, and everything, you know, are up so so high, especially lower income. Now they're spending all of their discretionary income on gas and food. So they're not spending as much, you know, 
retail or other discretionary spending, right? And so that's mm-hmm. part of what's driving uh, some of the recession. Um, so I think it's a it's an interesting sort of balance. Um, and we're having discussions in our company right now about that because, you know, we're having conversations about increasing our prices because I don't know what it's like in, you know, Australia and New Zealand, but the price of labor certainly is going up. Oh, yeah. And so we've got, you know, we, we've had double digit increase in terms of our average, you know, averages in terms of labor costs, you know, this past year. Yeah. Um, a lot of our tools, I mean, everything's going up in price, right? So we're feeling that pressure. And so we're talking about, hey, do we do, do we not raise prices to, to, to which of our stack do we do that, you know, et cetera. Um, and then obviously the customers are feeling as well. And so there's also a driver, like you said, hey, can we outsource this? Can we become more efficient to be able to drive it down? So it's going to be um, interesting to see how MSPs approach that. And we're still trying to figure out our strategy on that as well, because like we got to figure out how to keep our own costs down um, in order to be able to help customers keep their costs down. And so, you know, but there's also an opportunity with the existing customer base to potentially raise prices as well in that. So Mm -hmm. you got to know your competitive market to know, you know, where you can do that, not, um, you know, but, but that's the thing that makes this recession different from, and it has happened before. I think, I guess it was like the eighties that it happened, although I wasn't around to, uh, to have any experience with that. Um, but it's but, been a uh, long, long time that we've dealt with both inflation and a recession simultaneously that makes it a little bit of a new market condition for the vast majority of us out there. Yeah. I, look, I'm, I am no economist, but I'm, I feel like it's stagflation that we're talking about. I mean, what we had in 08 was a, a demand side issue. We've got a supply side issue this time. Um, everything's scarce. Prices are going up, as you say, driving inflation. But um, yeah, it's it's... It's not great, uh, but there are opportunities. Uh, but to your to your point, you know the the cost of everything here is also up. Uh, wages, goods, everything. Uh, so the the scarcity is global, and and that's definitely the the root of the issue, as far as we can tell. Um, right. The one good thing is, I, I at least from who I, people I'm reading, that this one's going to probably be far more mild um, than the the last one. So the crossed. last one was fingers crossed. Yes, but that's what the experts say anyway. So I'm, I'm hopeful they're right. Yeah. Um, my, uh, my share portfolio would, uh, would disagree at the moment, but, uh, you know, the year is young. Um, so, uh, again, first world problems, I'll be fine. Uh, the, the thing I want to talk about going back on the M&A front is integration, right? You're doing a high number of, um, you know, small to medium size acquisitions. The integration cost, I guess, is proportional to that because the bigger the company, the, the more integration required. Can you talk us through some of the the key um, wins and and failures you've had in that space, and what your advice would be to to new players? Well, the first one we did the worst on um, <laughs> because we had no clue what we were doing. Sure, um, you know the uh, uh, you know we had a a checklist on the first one, and it was it could fit on like one page, you know, uh, in terms of what our checklist was, you know. Now we've got a spreadsheet that's got like 12 tabs and, you know, checklist on each tab and, you know, the whole nine yards as we've just, um, it's kind of like, you know, uh, um, anytime that you see some sort of sign, like don't jump in an elevator or whatever, it's usually because some idiots have done that. And now you're like, okay, you know, don't do yeah. that. So a lot of those things on the list, it's like, oh, okay, don't do that. All right. Don't do that. You know, down, down, down the line. Um, so I, some of the things I would say less biggest lessons learned. Uh, The first one I would say is we, we all use the same language in the MSP community for the most part, but we don't all mean the same thing. So I'll give a practical example. There was one of the companies we acquired and I asked them, you know, how much service revenue that they had. I think I might've even been looking at the financials and I was like, it was like 90% of their revenue was service revenue. And I was like, how is that possible? In our world, we had defined service revenue as break fix. They called the help desk, requested to come out, time and material, that was service revenue for us. So in, in our model, we have recurring revenue, and then we got all the different you know stack under recurring revenue. And then we have project revenue, and then project revenue was either sell, like, hey, it's on a you know quote that we gave the customer, or it was time and materials, means it was unquoted. So that was our service revenue, which made up, you know, 10% or something like that of our total revenue. Okay. So they were showing like 90%. So I'm like, 
Okay, this makes no sense. Well, they defined anything that involved labor as service revenue. So all of their recurring was under service revenue. All their TNN was under, basically everything except for product sales was service revenue for them. And so, ninety percent. Hence ninety percent. Which once you understand that definition, you're like, oh, well, that makes sense. An MSP, you would have ten percent that would be product, and ninety percent would be everything else, right? So you know, it made perfect sense. But just just as an example of yep. when you use a term, um, what people may mean by it can be can be be very different. So part of the the thing that I'll do is like when I'll ask for examples. I'll ask people to explain to me the same thing multiple different times in different ways. I'll rephrase it back to them um, and say, well, is this, this is how we would do that in our businesses. Is that, is that, is that what you're talking about? And to try to really dig deeper. Um, there was a lot of mistakes that we made with the first acquisition because we thought we were on the same page. And then as we dug deeper and deeper into it, you know, realizing that you're talking apples and oranges and, and, and having no earthly idea. Uh, so that was one of the big lessons is just you got to get into the details. You got to be specific as you start to, you know, even with things like language, even words. And what are those? What are they? What do they mean by, by those in their business? Uh, one of the next things I would mention is uh, pricing. So this was a massive lesson for us. Um, also happened with the first company. So we looked at their pricing model. Um, and it was very much in line with ours. There was a few tweaks, but it was within 10%. And we, we actually, I think we took some of the stuff that they were doing and actually tweaked our own and, you know, it was, and, and, and moved forward. And so we thought that we were in a good place. What we did not realize was that how they had historic customers who could have been on a completely different pricing model. Right. So their advertised their advertised their advertised rates were aligned with yours, but the historic rates were all over the show. Correct. Okay. Correct. And our company being fairly mature, we were renewing customers every two to four years. And we would get them up to current rates as a part of that. And we would sell them new things and bring in, you know, so that was that was part of how we operated. Again, going back to the assumptions, that's how we operated. And so we wasn't really like top of mind of like they had customers they had sold 10 years ago. Maybe when they sold 10 years ago, they gave them a, a discount to get them to sign up or whatever. And they had not increased that customer's price once in 10 years. So you're taking a 10-year-old price that was discounted that in some cases were less than 50% of the current price that we would charge to a brand new customer. Um, so we thought we had checked the box on that because we reviewed their pricing and under we, we, we spent we, we spent a lot of time. We went through the model. We understood it. We compared it. And so we thought that we... We're all on the same page. And then um, when we were starting to look at some of the metrics and getting deeper into the business, we're like, why is this? Why are we not making more money here? And eventually we led all the way back to the per customer level. And, we, and then we finally figured out, oh, well, you're charging half as much as you should be for some of these customers. And, and other customers might have been 10% off or something. So it was like every yeah. single one. But there were some customers that were egregious and some that were, you know, um, more uh, on a minor basis. Um, so that caused us to make some bad decisions in the company in terms of personnel, just a lot of different things because what we thought the numbers were telling us and what they really were telling us, um, you know, we were missing that, we were missing that critical element. Um, yeah. and so it, you know, we, we ended up making some bad decisions as a part of that process because, you know, um, we were looking at the, you know, whatever the barometer, whatever upside down, you know? And so, you know, if you're, you know, if you don't understand the, the, what the KPI is actually telling you, then you can make some bad decisions basing it off of those KPIs. Yeah. So, um, so that was a, that was a pretty important lesson, um, you know, that, that we learned. Uh, another interesting sort of lesson and is just like for us, you've got the local, uh, factor. And so that's been something, and, and that one's really hard because like some of the lessons learned like pricing, that's pretty easy because now all of the companies we're acquiring, that's something that we're looking at, right? I can take that one thing and just apply it across the board. The local factor gets a little bit harder because there's always differences in each of the locations that we're acquiring. Mm. And so you got to figure out like, how does that town operate from a decision perspective? 
um, who are your key customers. Um, and to some extent, I guess it's not going to be the same as maybe where your home office is, but you know how your home city works and how it operates and its idiosyncrasies and how you fit into that overall community. And so you got to figure out those same sort of questions and answers for each of those companies that you're acquiring. And then how do you, how do you blend who you are from a macro company perspective and make it fit into each of those markets? So in that particular perspective, how important is the personnel piece? Like, have you found that to, to really get the greatest return um, on your acquisitions and to um, best engage with the local community and, and keep that thing that made them uh, an effective operating unit in the first place. Have you found that you've needed to offer like retention bonuses to key staff or have you had to really work hard to document what they do and how they do it once you acquire or how have you, how have you made sure that you keep that value? Yeah, so definitely, you know, there's contracts for key staff. Um, I, I think probably even more important than that is uh, just appreciating the key staff. You know, um, one of the things in our process, so whenever we acquire a company, if at all possible logistically, I will be on site at the company we've acquired within 24 hours to meet all the employees. Um, I want to meet them personally myself. I, I spend 15 to 30 minutes with every employee. I talk with them about their compensation, talk with them about the company, ask them, hey, what do you like? What would you like to see change? So be beginning to build that connection immediately. Uh, and and helping them to see, you know, because the first thing that every employee thinks of, all right, there's always the bad scenarios. They always know Uncle Joe, who used to work at a company, it got acquired. And the next day they came in and fired half of the people, yeah, right? Totally. So whenever people say we've sold the business, we've been acquired, 99% of the employees in their head says, oh my gosh, did I, did I, am I about to get fired? Do I need to start go looking? And that's where their mind immediately goes. So that's why, I mean, in, in some of the best scenarios, I'm on site within like two hours of the owner letting them know. Um, I call it bringing Oz out from behind the curtain. Um, you know, if you've seen the, you know, seen Wizard of Oz, like Oz is not scary at all. He's this, I, I guess maybe this is a bad example because it sounds like I'm a puny old guy. <laughs> but, you know, the point is that, you know, he's not scary. And once you understand that, you're like, oh, like, so I want people to be like, oh, Will's a normal guy like us. And he's approachable and he has stupid dad jokes that no one laughs at. And you know, you got you, you um, to use he's them, completed an Iron Man, but we look at him and we don't know how he completed the Iron Man, you know. So um, I get the feeling but, that but, you get the Iron but, Man comment in there probably within the first 20 or 30 minutes of meeting them. It's like, hi, hi, uh, new owner of the business also did an Iron Man. Uh, moving on, though. <laughs> awesome. Actually, it is in my presentation. It is in my presentation, but I but I have a picture of my family in my presentation, everything, okay. you know, because like I want I want to connect with them and say, look. I got hobbies. I got a family. I got, this is not all about work for yeah, me. Yeah, you got to be human, you right? You know, I want to be human. I want to connect with them. I want them to understand, you know, because you got to build, I mean, it's just like with customers, right? You got to build that trust. You got to build that rapport. Um, and so that's why I go on site. I love to be in person, spend that time. Uh, we used to have a monthly meeting with all employees. And after we start acquisitions, we moved to a weekly. Wow. And the big reason for that is we, it's 10 minutes, super, super efficient. Um, and, uh, the big part of that is sharing our culture. And so those new acquisitions get to see, oh, IT voice is a fun, exciting place to be. And if you do it once a month, it's only 12 times. I mean, you're a quarter in and they've only, you know, really interacted three times, you know, that's not a whole lot. So, um, and I, one of the coolest things that we actually did with that, I know this is not necessarily getting to your question, but one of the coolest things we've done recently is we, we have our, we have our call. It's at, 1.30, 12.30, 11.30, or 10.30 for the four time zones in the U.S. And 30 minutes before, I'll open the chat. We use Teams to do it. And I'll open the chat. And um, we it's a, ask anybody who wants to recognize or shout out to any other employee in the company for something that they did. And then um, we usually, like this last week, we had 55 of our 100 employees got recognized, which is pretty awesome. So we take all the names, we put them on, I don't know if y'all have uh, heard of like Wheel of Names, wheelofnames.com, but it's basically like a Wheel of Fortune, um, mm -hmm. you know, big wheel. And so everybody's name goes on one of the little slots and it spins around. And then we spin it like four times and you get four winners and they get a $50 Amazon card. Um, and so it, you know, just makes it fun. People feel appreciated and they're like, okay, this is a fun culture. You appreciate your people, things like that, you know, and you don't have to do that, right? But my point being is, 
showing the appreciation because most of those employees, they like that small field. They wanted to make sure that they could impact the customer. You know, uh, they have the what I call like the fireman syndrome, right? They love being there to help a customer, whether a customer deletes a file they need to get back or they can't work because, you know, something's not you know working on their, their machine. You know, most of the people in the MSP world, they love to help customers. And so when they see they get to continue to do that and they're a part of a team that loves doing that, then now all those questions they have about, am I going to have a job? And, you know, is my pay going to change as a supervisor? And all those worries that they have go away. And once those go away, and then now they start to say, oh, you're just like my family, but a little bit bigger. That's where we want to get to people as fast as we can. So, yeah, contracts with key employees certainly is important. Um, but ultimately, integrating the culture, I think, is far more important than um, um than, than, than trying to just get everybody under contract. Have you wrapped all the new brands under the IT Voice brand? We have. Okay. At this point, yeah. And what was the the thinking behind that? So, uh, a lot of it was driven out of logistics, yep. if you will. Um, as we wanted to integrate the companies into a s- single operating. Uh, platform, you know, PSA, as most people call it. And of course, your PSA, you know, pushes to your invoicing and accounting system. So for us to have eight different invoices, as an example, not me, eight different marketing campaigns, eight different, I mean, eight different everything, you know, it's just like, and, and at the size that we're doing with companies in the, you know, 500,000 to 2 million in EBITDA, they're just not big enough, you know. Now, if we were taking 10 million EBITDA companies and pushing them together, maybe it might be a different sort of story, you know. But, you know, a, a lot of times, I mean, for the, some of the companies we're acquiring, you've got the seller or the seller's, you know, spouse or whatever, or partner, I guess y'all call them in, in Australia, that's, uh, you know, maybe doing some of the accounting and they're exiting and, um, and a lot of times, I mean, a lot of times the owners are the ones that are like doing the accounting functions. Um, and if you have one of, or all of the owners that are exiting, you know, we don't necessarily want to hire like a GM or a controller for each location to handle like the accounting piece, you know? So most of the companies we're acquiring, you usually have a really strong operations manager that's already in place and that works really well. So they bridge in as a part and they, but they, they own that market, um, you know, for us. But a lot of times, you know, either the seller's taking a, a step back or exiting or whatever that may look like. And so we want to integrate the accounting side. So it just logistically trying to maintain eight different brands um, was going to be a lot harder. Uh, now you can kind of see, um, well, no, there's not in this shirt, never mind. But <laughs> on, on the initial shirts that we did, uh, like even when we rebranded ourselves, because, you know, in our home office, we were Slappy Communications, which was great in our market because people knew it, my last name, all that. Yeah. But in other markets, they're like a slappy what? Yeah. You know, just confusion. So, um, you know, we rebranded to more to say what we do. We do IT and we do voice. And so we were really happy we got that name. But originally speaking, we said the new slappy communication. Um, so each company had IT voice and under, you know, kind of the subline is the new legacy company name. So we try to bridge that so that customers, you know, would be like, oh, yeah. Yes. That's the new Slappy. Uh, That's the new Presidium. That's the new OnTech. I saw a billboard uh, you posted a picture of actually on LinkedIn um, showing one of those examples. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So, um, one of the things we made a mistake of uh, when we uh, purchased our, our first company at Lightwire going back probably about six months before I joined, so probably almost six years now, uh, was um, probably being more keen to purchase than the, the, the owner was to sell. And so, the due diligence process was not as exhaustive as it would have otherwise been where there were certain things that that guy just wasn't particularly interested in divulging until the deal was done at which point you know you you're you're in uh, for good or bad um how do you how do you temper your enthusiasm to make sure that you follow the really well structured process you now have um you know how do you how do you make sure that you're not uh skipping any steps just because you see so much uh you know such a great opportunity in front of you I don't know that we do, to be honest. Um, a, a, a lot of it will come down to what the multiple on the deal is. So the higher the multiple, the more stringent we will be with our process. Okay. Because we don't have as much room for error. 
if it's a if it's a lower multiple, there's more room for error because you know, like we, we had a conversation uh, as a board the other day and there was one particular one and there was a difficult kind of situation. But as we were looking at it, we're like, OK, yeah, it is what it is. But we said at the multiple and overall big picture of what that company brings. Are we really going to let this item that's not ideal kill the deal? Yeah. And it was kind of an easy answer. Well, like when we looked at it in that context, it was kind of an easy answer. Now, if it had been a higher multiple, that might have killed the deal. So that is one thing maybe to kind of a little bit keep in mind as a seller. If you get the best, you know, everybody's like, I want the highest multiple. That's great. But if you get the highest multiple, um, we've actually got at least two companies right now, maybe three, who have come back to us after they rejected our offer, did a deal with somebody else, and it fell through. And then now they come back and say, hey, are you still interested? And so, you know, the highest offer may also have more stringent due diligence process and there's less room for error for them. And so depending on what the information shows or what information you can't get, that may kick you out of their process. And, you know, because I think some sellers think like, OK, they got the LOI and they're like, all right, like deal's done kind of thing. And there's still a lot to be done. I would say 100% of our deals, the seller is fairly fatigued, not completely fatigued by the time we get done with it. That's a really That's, good call. You know, yeah, just the concept that your conversation isn't the first one they've had. You know, you might have had a conversation, walked away, come back after they've had more. Yeah, that, that's where some of that sort of lack of buy-in might be perceived, right? They're just tired. Yeah. Yeah, and in, in most of the companies, actually, we see that they usually dip after we buy them, and we attribute that to the fatigue of the buying process. You know, because you're you're running the company just like you were doing every other week and month before, but now you've got a part-time job, maybe even a full-time job, gathering all this information, talking to vendors, you know, getting your landlord to sign the landlord's consent, you know, all this stuff that you're having to do to sell the company. And so you're literally, you know, working two jobs for a couple of months while you're trying to go through that whole process. Um, not to mention, you know, um, the emotional for a lot of you know for a lot of people it it was their business they started from scratch maybe it was in their garage maybe it was a hobby maybe it was part time you know but they know every single customer they built this from scratch and so there's a hey I'm you know <laughs> I'm selling my baby away kind of thing that goes along with that as well uh, in the process and there's a lot of uncertainty because they're like okay are these new people going to take care of it mm. uh, are they going to appreciate like I have are they going to continue to do these things are they there's a so there's 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 both the emotional impact of hey you're selling a business that you have you know poured your blood sweat and tears into you know probably for decades um as well as the hard work that it takes yeah so you know it's it's definitely tends to be you know pretty exhausting um I think one you know the there was there was the two sellers who had done transactions before were the easiest transactions that we did because I think emotionally it was easier for them. That they just had better expectations in terms of what it was going to take. Yeah. And so even even you know through the whole process, um, I think probably one of the biggest mistakes um, that I see sellers make is the counsel that they choose to get, whether it be CPA mainly attorneys, if they're not M&A attorneys that don't understand deal structures and, and, and kind of the norms, if you will, right, of how these things go, they can get some really bad advice that can just really drag the process out um, uh, un unnecessarily and, and, and make it miserable for everybody versus having an M&A attorney that does it day in and day out and that can just shoot them straight and say, look, yeah. this is normal. This is a if you like, if you want to sell your business, this is the way it happens, right? And if you don't want to sell your business, you don't have to, right? It's always your choice. Yeah. But you know, whether you sell it to these guys or somebody else, like this is this is how it works, and that they can shoot you straight. Because because sometimes, I mean, you know, there's certain bad buyers out there that will tell you all sorts of stuff that may not be true. Um, and so you you know you need people in your corner that can shoot you straight. Um, but at the end of the day, you I mean you're not going to be able to sell a company without making reps and warrants. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, that's a, you know, but somebody be like, well, I don't want to warrant that, or I don't want to rep that. It's like, well, then you can't sell your company. But a good attorney is going to be able to walk somebody through that and help them really understand what that risk really means. Um, you know, in that process. 
How many uh, of the owners that sell remain in the business under the models that you work with? Are there earnouts regularly, or does it take another another model? So we don't do any earnouts. Uh, the reason we don't do earnouts is because they're too ambiguous. Um, one one uh, 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 raving fan book. If you're familiar with it, not. if you're not, I'll, I'll give you the 30 second version of it. Cool. It's, it's, it's designed towards customers, but you make raving fans or you make happy people. You make a happy partner, happy friends, happy employees, set clear expectations and exceed those expectations by 1%. With your customers, doesn't matter. Everybody, you can make them happy by doing that. Earnouts are inevitably just um, ambiguous. And so the chances of not being on the same page with somebody is really high and it's not worth it to us because you don't want to, neither party wants the other party upset at them because that's probably going to end poorly for everybody. You know, you want it to be a good deal for everybody. You want everybody to be happy with it. And so earnouts can be a hard, hard way to do that, especially with our strategy of integrating the companies. Because it's not like if, if it wasn't integrating it and it was going to stay separate, it was just going to be a subsidiary. It was going to be independently operated. An earnout could, especially if it was based on revenue, hey, that could be fair, right? I mean, it is what it is. In our case, when you start integrating, yeah, and it, it gets a lot harder because now your financials are getting merged as part of this larger entity, and so you know now the way that we account, they don't like the way we account. They don't think something's fair, whether it is or is not. It just gets ambiguous, and then you're likely to you know, have a, have a bad, bad relationship there. And we don't want to have that not for their sake, not for our sake and not, not for, you know, we're going to buy other companies and we can't afford to have a bad reputation in the market. Yep. Um, and so we, you know, we can't, can't let that happen. So we don't ever, ever do, uh, you know, earnouts. The way that we do it, uh, that's kind of similar is that um, we let uh, sellers have a retained stake in the company. And so now this is what people commonly refer to as the second bite of the apple. So at some point down the road, you know, we'll have uh, an exit. And when we have an exit, then now they will get possibly a bigger bite than what they even got the first time. Right. So it's kind of, it has the same effect of an earn out of, hey, they're not getting it all up front. Um, but their, you know, their second bite, my second bite, all of the sellers, like we're all in the same pool together. So it's not like somebody wins it, you know, somebody else's cost or vice versa. We're all in the pool together. So everybody is incentivized for the company to do the best because everybody has an ownership in, in the company, you know, going forward. Okay. So that's, uh, you know, that's the way that, that, uh, that we handle that. Getting back to your question about, um, you know, we, we've had owners everywhere from exit as fast as three months, which is really, really fast to, they want to stay on for five plus years. Um, okay. had some that like three years, some a year, um, most common would, you know, most common would probably be, they're going to stay on long-term or one year. That's probably the most common. Uh, but we've had some that have been been faster. And then you also have like, I guess we had one guy who actually left like one month. Um, but in that case, there were three partners and he was the only one leaving and the other two were staying. So it, yeah, you know, wasn't it wasn't as stopper. much of a need in that. Right. In, in that case. And so, and that's part of what drove the sale was his retirement. Um, and so, so yeah, if it's a one seller, one person seller is different from multi-sellers and if, you know, um, if people are going to, you know, if, if, you know, a lot of times you'll have one seller that, Hey, they're going to stay on indefinitely with you, but somebody else is going to get out fairly quickly. So that's, that's probably the most common instance. Cool. Hey, we're going to need to wrap this up in a sec. So I just want to, um, something I should have asked at the beginning because it helps set the scene nicely is just to give us a, an idea of scale. If you can, um, whether it's employee numbers or, uh, revenue numbers, whatever you're happy to divulge, but from, um, back, uh, when you were, you know, just, um, Slappy, slappy communications uh, through to now. What's the the growth journey you've seen you get to? Yeah, so when uh, when we first started, we were six and a half million in revenue, about one point eight million um, in EBITDA, and now through the end of twenty twenty one, we're about twenty four million in revenue and about five million in EBITDA. Okay, we had about I don't know thirty something employees, thirty two, thirty three, something like that employees, and now we're right at a hundred employees. It sounds like you're going to be uh, clients, significantly more than that soon. Yeah, clients. We, I think we're at 300 clients. You know, when it was just us, and now we're up to about 1,200. Okay. So pretty much, I mean, whichever the metrics, we're pretty much four times larger than we were, you know, three years ago on pretty much, you know, all of uh, the different numbers. And 
uh, will probably be twice the size by the end of this year. Well, wow. all right. We should get you back on in uh, in another year or two and and see what lessons have been learned from the the next size up in that growth uh, that growth experience. Yeah, I'm sure I'm going to tell you don't do eight acquisitions in six months. That's probably what I'll tell you next time I'm on here. <laughs> well, I look forward to you learning about the hard way, coming back and uh, teaching everyone else uh, in a much easier way. Uh, that that's great. Yeah. All right. This this past December we did two acquisitions. And launched our rebrand all within a one week period, and that was uh, Oof. that was insane. In December too, like when things theoretically should be quieting down a touch. Um, yeah, my my week off didn't happen. Hey, uh, mate, thank you very much for coming on and uh, and talking to us. I wish you all the best with the many many uh, acquisitions you've got ahead of you, and uh, we'll keep in touch and and figure out. Uh, well, hopefully, hear how it all went. Yeah, you as well. <laughs>